Welcome back to Soul Back. This is the R&B Podcast. Kyle here, back with Tom and Ed. What is going on, fellas? What's up, players? What's up, guys? So, guys, a lot to talk about in R&B this week. I know both of you guys are fired up, but I wanted to take this time to start out this podcast because we always talk about food. Um, I Mm -hmm. recently watched a JoJo documentary, uh, the female singer JoJo, that is. I think Up Rocks, I think that's the website. They put together a documentary with JoJo just to bring us up to date with what she's been doing and also, you know, her hiatus for like 10 years and the label politics that came with that. Um, One of the parts of the interview that I thought was really interesting was that the label, uh, Blackground, made her go on a 500 calorie per day diet to get her weight to a certain amount because they felt she needed to be at a certain weight in order to put out the album for her image and stuff. So I went on Google and I started searching up 500 calorie per day diets. And I don't know if you guys can do it, guys. 500 calories a day is absolutely ridiculous. You're supposed to eat 2,000. If you're like dieting, maybe 1,500 or like something like that. 500 calories is like one meal, barely. Well, I wish you would have told what? me about this before. I would have brought up some some meals, unless you got something prepared like that you couldn't even eat for the whole day. <laughs> you could have like <laughs> a quarter of, of a Big Mac or something. That, All right, that's well, it. I have, I, I I have found a recipe that I think will work for you guys. No, uh, well, first of all, you guys can only you, you guys can only have two meals, so you're either picking lunch or, or uh, breakfast. You can't have both. We'll call it brunch. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So for brunch, you're having a two-egg spinach omelet. Sounds healthy. Mm. Egg it whites sounds healthy, egg but eggs. I'm sure that's not going to be filling. Oh, most definitely egg whites, Tom. Yeah. And then for dinner, Ed, you'll be excited about this one. You can have hummus and raw vegetables. Mm-mm-mm. I'm going to eat the same thing that people feed their freaking rabbits. <laughs> and that's and it for the whole day? Between- well, in between those two meals for your snack, you can have popcorn. That's pretty good. Oh, I mean, you might as well just eat air at that point. Popcorn? That's Jeez. I mean, what are you going to have some, like, I mean, this is ridiculous. This is, it's sad where we have to be. where, And I know this is always the industry, so I can't be like, oh, this is a new thing. But there's so much of image over talent in this industry. It's ridiculous. I don't care if JoJo is 700 pounds. Is the music hot? That's all I care about. I don't care about her waistline. It's a shame. Interestingly enough, I don't remember anyone, and maybe you can correct me, Kyle, if I'm wrong, but did anyone ever consider JoJo to be a sex symbol? No, not at the time. She came out when she was like 14. The second (laughs) album was 16. So when you get to the third album, you're 18. I don't, like, JoJo is more of a sex symbol now than she was when she first came out. Kind of interesting just to see from the eyes of music industry uh, heads how they feel people need to be in order to be successful. So, I mean, shout out to JoJo. She got out of that situation. She looks great. She still sounds great. She has a new album coming out, I think, later this year. Um, she has a single coming out in a couple of weeks. So, also announced her tour. But um, a lot of other things we need to discuss. Um, can we first start off? I know this is a music podcast, but we have to give people the real and give them an update on Drew Hill like we have for the last year. (laughs) And did you see the Unsung episode? Of course, I did see it. It was quite entertaining. I do think that there was just too much ground to cover, so they just glossed over so much stuff. Should have been a two-parter. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing I didn't really understand, and I think you're right on that, because they didn't even mention a lot of the key moments that happened, like the infamous radio interview where Woody just quits out of the blue and Cisco storms out. I wanted to know what happened with that. Yeah, I wanted to hear about that because, you know, there's rumors that that was staged and it was real, and they didn't really touch at all on the stuff going into um, Independence Day. They really glossed over the the solo career of Cisco. They talked about the first album a little bit. Didn't mention the second album at all. And I know some people have been critical, but they really only had, I guess, like 45 minutes when you don't count commercials to get all of this in. It's just way too much history. But what we got was good. Yeah. But, Tom, 
a lot of drama has unfolded after that unsung episode. First, I saw Woody on Instagram posting things like, I should have never done that documentary. I should have learned the first time that they wouldn't get my story right. And no. then Nokio went live on an interview on radio and said that he's no longer a part of the group. Mentioned a couple of the names that we're familiar with, like Kevin Peck. Shouts to the <laughs> longtime manager. <laughs> But, yep. man, Tom, what's going on? I mean, we knew Nokio and the group were having issues. I don't know if it's, you know, with the members or with the manager, but this is also crazy. Nokio, man. I mean, I know he's been going through some things on Instagram as well. Well, we got an interesting call, actually, from a 443 number out of Baltimore, Maryland. It ended up being Jazz and his pops who were looking to do an interview with us to, to set the story straight about Ian Sung. I guess they didn't get his story straight either. So that was an interesting moment, and we'll be sharing that interview that we did with Jazz pretty soon. But, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I guess it, it, it's what you expected. There's been so much drama with the group and lineup changes over the year. It, it kind of shook out how you expected. I mean, even Teo, I don't think, was was happy with the outcome. And, you know, Drew Hill, I mean, they're still here. Um, Playa plus Cisco at this point. But, I mean, I guess it got them a lot of attention. Yeah. Ed, let me ask you this. Mm Mm-hmm. When you do a documentary like this with Unsung about a group, and I'm going to assume that the current Drew Hill management team has full control over what the narrative is, it's it's expected that they would probably want to highlight all the highs and just glaze over all the lows, right? Of course, because they're still trying to protect a brand, and that's what's most important. They can't be like, oh, this brand is corrupt and everybody's crazy and we're mismanaged and garbage. So they have to kind of put a positive spin on things, so to speak. So, Tom, with that all said, and you've lived the Drew Hill legacy from when it first started up until now, where it's really just Cisco and two player members. We know the great music that they've put out, especially with those first two albums, that Cisco debut as well. And I guess you can count the Playa album if we're really looking at it now. But how much, when you look at their legacy, is it based on the good music? And how much of it are you reminded of all the group's members breaking up? Well, there's a couple things involved. So people still said, oh, it's still, as long as Cisco is involved, that's still Drew Hill. The problem is with that, people didn't even realize, you know, Jazz was singing the leads on some of the earlier songs. Same with Woody. Mm -hmm. Like, they didn't realize Mm -hmm. the talent involved from the other members. People just think, oh, Cisco is Drew Hill, but that's not the case. So, I don't, I I can't say this is really Drew Hill. It's like Cisco singing Drew Hill hits along with Playa backing him up. Like, it doesn't, people might get tricked in this thinking it is, but to me, it's just not, it's just not the same. And, Unfortunately, I do feel like it hurts their legacy. I mean, the single they put out was dope. I think we all liked it. But I don't know if you can still call this Drew Hill at all. I mean, listen, other groups, legendary groups have had lineup changes. But I don't know if it's been anything this drastic to where you're just down to one of the original members and then just keep adding others on. Like, it's just, to me, not the same. I don't think, and we've talked about this a little bit before. Again, it's not something that's unprecedented. We see it a lot. But the difference between those earlier groups from the 60s and going into the 70s and Drew Hill is that Drew Hill were very four and distinct personalities. It's almost like how we talk about the Wu-Tang Clan. Like there's everybody seems extremely different. They're just not four random dudes. And Cisco is, of course, the most prominent. But everybody knows jazz. Everybody knows um, Nokio and then Woody as well. So these are four very distinct members that make up the group. And it's funny that you mentioned people talking about the legacy of Drew Hill and then just tying it all to Cisco, which is clearly anybody saying that is not a Drew Hill fan and don't know what they're talking about. Because when you go back and look at those earlier hits, Cisco was like the energy, but Jazz was bringing the soul and Nokia was bringing the pen and Woody was tying it all together. So to just put it at the feet of Cisco is a little disrespectful to these three other brothers. And I don't know what their beefs are as far as what they didn't like about Unsung and wanting to tell their own story. And I'm interested in hearing their side of it because, of course, everybody's got their own side. Everybody wants to have the majority of the camera time. So I'm not surprised that folks are like, oh, they didn't do enough me. 
Because, you know, we're self-centered like that. We want to tell our story. But, man, there's just so much to Drew Hill that goes beyond a dude with the blonde hair that screams all the time. And losing <laughs> part of that, while I'm okay with lineup changes a little bit more than other people, it does hurt to not have those core members because they just meant so much to the overall package. Mm-hmm. But I will say this. Um, because we actually have a good relationship with every member of Drew Hill, so we fully support everyone individually. We hope one day they'll all just come together as like an eight-man group. That's what Nokia wants. He says in order for him to join the group again, it has to be all eight of them. And uh, can you imagine if all eight of them are on stage doing the Tell Me dance? They might bump into each other. <laughs> it oh, might be geez. an earthquake from Baltimore. I mean, I'd yeah. love that thought, though, because that just having all of them together. And think about the individual talents. Because even Skull and Tail, like, these aren't bums. These dudes can sing in their own right. And, of course, my boys from play are extremely underrated. So all of them together are a formidable package. I would love to see it happen. There's more to Drew Hill than Cisco, y'all. Anybody that says that is getting the back of my hand because that annoys me. <laughs> well, if that doesn't happen, if they're not able to get back into Drew Hill, the likes of Jazz and Nokio and Woody, Tail and Scola, Tom, I've, I've got a, a proposal here. What if Uh-oh. they join... Have you seen Mariah Carey's Instagram where she's singing like backstage in her uh, dressing room? She's, she's singing like, a cappella songs with her backup singers? No. It's actually yeah, so cool. We she, need to check it out. Okay. Yeah, so she's been singing like B cuts or unreleased songs with her backup singers just for the fans, for them to go nuts over. Recently she sang uh, Slipping Away. So we can have Jazz and them sing background for her. That'd be kind of cool. No. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, boy. Jazz can do a little better than that, but I wouldn't be mad at that. I love the little Mariah clips. Shout out to Cassandra Jordan. She always shares them in the Soul and Stereo Cypher. I think that's the last one I saw was Melt Away. Really good stuff. So, there's that. Now, let's get into some new music in R&B that came out this week. And this one is rather interesting. This is straight from the Trolls World Tour soundtrack. Justin Timberlake <laughs> has hooked up with SZA for a disco-sounding song. Um, this song is really the first... That we've heard from SZA since that DJ Khaled song that sampled Outkast. Ed, I know Ugh. how much you love that song. And Ugh. this is the first Justin Timberlake song. Actually, he had a song with Meek Mill earlier in the year. So, Tom, Justin Timberlake, he's collaborating with a bunch of different people. Oh, is boy. I've been waiting for Tom's. Uh, I'm waiting for well, what you... Can I, I can say it. The... Well, Go Tom, ahead, let's get the opinion player. on the record first before we get into the collaboration. I mean, the record's fine. It's like that other Trolls dancey song he did. It's not for me. I mean, it is what it is, you know. But was, hmm, let me think of a good name I could come up with from Justin Timberlake's era. Was Jazz not available for a collaboration? Jazz? <laughs> jazz? He, came out the same, he was from the same era. Jazz? Did you really just say that Justin Timberlake should do a song with Jazz? Could you imagine? God. I can imagine. I don't want to. I mean, That'd yes, be it would be. To see. <laughs> that would be a quality song, yes. But if you think these little kids are dancing around to troll songs from Justin Timberlake and Jazz, what in the world? Why am I for here? those for those just tuning in to the podcast for the first time? Uh, every time. An older artist collabs with a younger artist to try to seemingly remain relevant. I go off on them and start making recommendations on who they should have collaborated with from their own generation. So, uh, Justin Timberlake, you don't get a free pass either. Oh, my. God. Well, we'll work on the Justin Timberlake and Mystical remix to make you happy. Because <laughs> we're looking for people that came out at the same era. Yeah. So... The song is called The Other Side. And what did you think about this song? And, and especially, I know you were a fan of SZA's debut album. Um, and a lot of people have already started deeming that as a classic. And they're waiting on the second one. But what did you think of this collaboration? This is kind of a different sound for SZA. Who on earth said that debut was a classic? Good lord. Y'all know that. 
out that tag around too much. It was fine. I thought it was good. I haven't had a chance to hear this song yet. I was a little off the grid this week, so I've heard everyone talking about the song. And to your point, Kyle, it did seem like that it's going to be in the mold of that super upbeat song from the last Trolls movie. So, like Tom said, it ain't going to be for me. I'll check it out. I think having SZA on something this, that I assume is this upbeat. Again, I'm just talking from what I have heard. I have not heard this track at all, so I can't weigh in. But it seems like a weird kind of mix to have those two together on that song. I don't know. Well, don't forget, SZA did that song with Maroon 5 where they gave her like half a bar in the second verse. So that oh, yes. was like a pop, <laughs> poppy up-tempo song that was... Not very good also. No, I was going to say, I didn't like that one that much. I almost forgot she was on that song. It's almost <laughs> like she snuck in the studio and then like <laughs> said two bars and ran away. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And let me ask you this. Did Summer Walker steal Scissor's Lane as the quote-unquote mumble singing female artist? <laughs> mumble. mumble singing... I will put Scissor stuff over Summer Walker's garbage any day of the week. So I think that there might be a little bit of overlap as far as fan bases, a little. But I don't know. I feel like those are two completely different, uh, two different lanes for me. And there's one lane I enjoy. Other lane needs to be closed down forever. Somebody needs to shut that interstate down. So there's that. Now, another record that came out, Tom, I know last time you weren't a fan of her song titles. What was it called? Pussy Fairy Tale on the way. Oh, God. We didn't post that one. <laughs> but we posted this new oh, my one. God. This one is called Ho Happiness <laughs> Over Everything, featuring Hold Miguel on. How did, and. How did that make it onto the website? Could someone explain Listen. that? I was intentionally not going to post that one either. I'll, you better talk to Kyle about that because I'm sure he has something <laughs> to do with that. Listen, anytime Miguel is on a record, we have to post it. We love Miguel. Now, this oh. song is actually a remake of an old song that Janae made called Ho as well. That one featured Gucci Mane. This one fe- uh, features Future. Miguel was on both. And I feel like it's cool. It's a cool record. And her new album, Chalambo, is set to come out early next month. Her next album. And from what you've heard so far, Ed, what are your thoughts? I know... You've had a couple of thoughts about some of those early records. One sounded like a cult ritual anthem, but what are your thoughts here? Well, again, I haven't heard this new one, but I hope it's better than that cult hypnosis stuff that she was dropping earlier. It sounds like some stuff that they play while they get you to drink bleach and slit your wrist. It's, oh, horrible. <laughs> but oh. I, a lot of these songs play out. They just... I know that she has a very rabid fan base that thinks that everything that she does is just like hotness and she, oh, she speaks to me so much. But a lot of it just feels like so gratuitous and not for because she's trying to tell a story, but almost for shock value. Like, why you got to call the song Ho? Like, what? What's the point? I don't, it feels like just a way to like get some buzz, get some initial stuff trending. Oh, Ho is trending on Twitter. I got to click on this. And it's just weird to me. I know that it's part of a marketing strategy in 2020 where we do the most depraved things to get attention. But it's just unnecessary. She's not a bad artist at all. As we were talking earlier this week on Facebook, I think that she has talent, but a lot of her songs to me are just okay. Like nothing ever gets over the hump to great. Everything's just... And a lot of these little parlor tricks that she does doesn't really help her case with me. Mm. Yeah. Well, I was gonna say, let me share. Like, I don't think I don't think Janae has a bad album, so I think this one will probably be fine as well. Yeah, she doesn't have a great one either. But I would just like to add, when I look back at the 2010s, I feel like she was one of the R&B artists who showed the most promise because once she put out those initial EPs. I think it was called Sail Out or Soul mm-hmm. Sailing or something. But everyone was on that. And everyone was talking about how good it was. And, man, she just did, like, a total misdirection from that sound and then just tried to, you know, go a more commercially sounding route, which is the most disappointing thing, if you ask me, because she really had a chance to influence others, you know, start a movement. And, man, it just – and she's still very popular, I guess. But, man, it, it – to me, it's been a disappointment since that. 
And for real, and the weird thing was, and I remember people saying at that time when that EP came out, this was like this was like I can't remember the term that they used, but it was almost like neo neo soul, like the new version of neo soul. Yeah. And she was, except it had like kind of a modern twist because, as she is, like her her lyrics are a little bit more, I don't want to say vulgar, but like I don't know, to in your face and to the point. So she really spoke to that generation, and then. She's talking about eating the booty like groceries. So it's just like, <laughs> why did we go all the way to the 180 on this thing? And that's what really kind of... And I know she had motherhood and running around with Big Sean, which is always a terrible decision to run around with. <laughs> but, wow. I mean, she just got a little... I'm never mad at somebody that decides to take their personal life and do that first. Seems like that became a priority. Music became secondary. She got a little bit more inconsistent, but she showed a lot of promise early on that just, to me, never was fulfilled. So there's that. Um, Speaking of promises that weren't fulfilled, guys, I'm still waiting on another new edition tour. Not a BBD tour, not a... (laughs) And don't uh, forget Heads of State. Heads of State was another Yes, Heads of State too. That's correct. Yep. And it doesn't look like there's going to be a new edition tour coming anytime soon because Johnny and Ralph are set to release a joint record together. Tom, can you fill us in? Well, let's clarify. Initially, I thought the press release, well, the press release did state that. Digging a little further, I got called from the label just to clarify. They signed on to do a joint single at first, hmm. and which will be on Ralph's album on the, on this label. Johnny is still promoting his Game Changer 2. He's not signed on with a new label to do a new album. So, um, Ralph Tresvant has a new album coming out, and Johnny Gill will be featured on the first single. So, that's coming, I think they said, in the spring. So, watch out for that. Are people in demand for a new Ralph album? I, I feel like no one ever asked for a Ralph, Ralph album. Ralph is always a weird, and I can speak because I saw this like kind of well, transition in his career It's been 15 years since his last one. Um, it's kind of weird my opinion, in based that. Based on the excitement we saw on when we posted this, I'd say, I'd say yes. So, Ed, I mean... I mean, what do you think? What do you think about his his solo albums? Would you even consider that we're ready for a new one? For a new solo joint? Yeah, I think that when you look back at his trajectory, it's always it was kind of weird because he was the guy after New Edition started having its kind of like not want to say breakup, but like when it was clear that everybody was going their separate ways. Ralph was like the next dude up, and it always had. He was this guy with kind of. Almost to the point where we're talking about with Janae. Like, he had this potential that everybody knew he was going to be the next star. And he had a couple of big hits. But it didn't really quite work out as far as him going to the next level of stardom. So I think there is a fan base that is very loyal to a New Edition. Very loyal to Ralph. That's just, like, ready for him to explode. So, yeah, I think there is a small contingent that's like, all right, let's see if you got it this time. They're ready to ride because... In 90, I don't know, 91, 92, he was the next one up. Didn't quite work out. Kevin Campbell kind of slid in that lane, but there was the high hopes for my boy. Well, for people that aren't aware of Ralph and his vocals, Ed, can't they just go back to listening to uh, Bobby Brown's Every Little Step? Didn't Ralph sing that song? Oh, God, gosh, don't get started on this again. <laughs> That's, that's an internet rumor that has been going on for a long, long time. <laughs> for uh, decades. But, Shout out to my boy Derek Dunn, because if he hears it, he hits the roof, and he has receipts, and he'll tell you what, that's a lie. And I'd be like, calm down, <laughs> brother. I didn't say I did it. I'm just telling you. <laughs> uh, but, Tom, more news from SRG, the label that is putting this single out. Sean Stockman is set to return, finally. He's got his new long-awaited single coming out. Uh, on Friday, so and then he, I think he's going to be announcing his album is finally coming, his long awaited solo album. So, well, that you know, people have been waiting a while because he's been teasing it, you know, on his social media for months, maybe even years now. So, years, we'll have to point. see. <laughs> yeah, so it'll be interesting to see what that sounds like. And hopefully, and just a little birdie told me we may just have the exclusive on that single, so stay tuned. No, well, that's what's up. Cause this uh, talk about Ralph, talk about Janae, another brother with less like unlimited potential. They just never quite manifested as a solo career. Sean was another one. We just knew 
was gonna hit that next level and be big solo, but it just never really materialized. So I'm kind of interested and a little excited about seeing how these veterans come back in 2020 to kind of, we saw Stokely a few years ago finally mm. give us that solo album and it was incredible. So it's always cool to kind of see, we had those what ifs in the 90s and now we're kind of seeing these artists kind of fulfill those fantasies we had back then. I'm for it. Well, Kyle, <clears throat> I would like to make a declaration right now. Yes. I think every single R&B artist should boycott putting out a new album or new music until Tevin Campbell releases something new. Who's with <laughs> me on that? Oh, we, need a, we might be waiting for a we while, need a guys. Tevin Campbell. <laughs> we need a Tevin Campbell album, guys. Come on. I'm, you know that. I look, I'm down for a Tevin album because I've heard him. He sounds pretty good. He still got it. Mm-hmm. Give me so, some Tevin. Yeah, but I'm not going to put... Let me, Yo, I'm not going to put the whole genre on pause for Tevin Campbell. Sorry, I'm <laughs> Don't not doing worry. that. I'm going to get the petition started. We'll get we'll get like thousands of signatures. We'll get that going. Well, yeah, oh, the I genre's already around. halfway on pause as it is, so we ain't missing much. <laughs> Let Tevin do. <laughs> yeah, but can you imagine if Tevin Campbell comes back and there's like a T Pain record, a Quavo record, and a Future record? You guys are going to regret oh. that ever that, that ever came out. Oh. Tevin would never. Tevin would never disappoint me like that. Oh. Never. That's what you said about Keith until Eeny Meeny Miny Mo came out, Ed. Uh, so the, for, first of all, keep the facts to yourself. I would like to have a nice evening on the podcast without being reminded of that horrible song. Even the legends can let you down every once in a while. Oh, what a terrible well, song! Speaking of facts, Edward. You mm-hmm. know what I did l- learn this week? And I'm, I'm going to reference you by Edward while talking about Keith Sweat. I learned okay. he was the, wor- the worst vocalist uh, of the 90s and still made good songs. Excuse me? It was tweeted to us. It must have been true. Oh, someone on the internet had a garbage opinion. <laughs> never, I have never heard this before. <laughs> Tell me more, player. <laughs> I just had to share that. No, no keep no. it to yourself. Well, Tom, can I make a statement as well? Okay. We're going to get Sean Stockman on the podcast. Oh, my gosh. Didn't we try this once or three times already? Yes, we did. And I promise you we will. If not, Tom and Ed will have to do the 500 calorie per day challenge. Oh, jeez. Well, I'm already 155 pounds. <laughs> Still not good enough for black round. <laughs> yeah, you aren't good enough. Sorry. You're, you'll never get your discography on Spotify talking like that, player. Oh. There you go. Uh, a couple more records I just want to highlight here. We don't really have to get into a lot of details on this, but uh, Tom, do you remember the artist Ravon? She was originally signed to Neo. Of course. She's finally back with a new record, Waters. thought it was a really dope record. Really liked her. Really liked her music. Remember that joint with Wally? I thought that was really good. Better be good. Don't forget the Essence like Festival where, where in the in the convention center where they played her song on repeat. Remember that, Kyle? About a hundred <laughs> times in a row. Yeah. So I think she was doing like a uh, a speech or something at the Essence Convention Center. A speech. <laughs> and that's what, was it a speech? I don't it know what it was. Signing. An interview. Autograph I guess signing. It was an interview. <laughs> it was an autograph signing. Um, and then they played her song "Best Friend." Which is actually a really good song, but they played it like a hundred yeah. times straight. I don't care what yeah. songs are going on, you can't play it a hundred times straight. You just Absolutely can't. not. I, I remember, I can't remember if it was Tom or Kyle, one of you told me that story. And I thought it was the most hilarious thing ever. And whenever she pops up, because she randomly popped up on Nas's album last year. And she was doing some background vocals. And every time I see her name, I think about her telling... Her poor little autograph session. She's sitting at her autograph session. My best friend is on repeat endlessly. I don't know why I have this image in my head, but I blame you two for that. (laughs) And then, Tom, Jade Nova dropped a new album. I know you're a fan of Jade. She's actually pretty dope, and she's got a movement going on on her own. I didn't realize she had a a celebrity following online, but we'll get the... uh, the album on the site. She's actually um, one most people don't know. Ed, do you know about her? Mm-hmm. I know about her. I did not know she had a new project out this week, though. Yep. Came out on Friday. Oh. Album is called Stages Go, Stages Go Stream That Now. 
Are you ready for some hard-hitting questions? Well, hold on, hold on, hold everything. Isn't this the podcast where we're supposed to talk about um, Young Ma and PJ Morton? Those are the hard-hitting questions, Tom. You're spoiling it for Okay, people. good. I've been waiting for 30 minutes, Kyle. Let's get it going. <laughs> oh, you don't know. You don't want me to wait for this because some uh, we're going to lose some sponsors after and, this. And one. don't forget don't forget to talk about Tank, too, all right? I, I Somehow I will problem. remind you of that. If not, if you forget, I will <laughs> happily remind you of that. Calm down. This is my segment. I am the host. All right. I have these questions. All right. You guys need to calm down before you guys start We're eating raw up. vegetables and hummus. Let's go. We're like some uh, rabid wolves hard- over here. <laughs> let's let's start out with this one. Hard hitting questions. I spoke to Mike from okay. 112 recently, just to find out what's going on with them because I haven't heard from them. The last time I heard. Slim was going off on everyone on Instagram because they were asking who the backup dancers were. Uh, but I, was, I spoke to Mike and I asked him what's going on with the music. They dropped the record tonight last year. Um, and it's kind of been quiet since then. So I asked what's going on. Mike says we had a lot recorded, but it sounded too much like the 112 of old. I know the fans won't accept that because there's two members missing. So oh. we've gone back in the studio to make some more music that doesn't sound like the old school 112. It's a new sound, and I think it's great. Tom and Ed, what does this mean for 112? And well, My. before you guys even answer that, as a 112 diehard fan, do you want the old sound or do you want a new sound because it's just two members now? Hmm. Ed, can I go first? You go first. See, this is what I've been talking about You know, in conversations with our readers on social media. Artists are getting confused because they don't even know what to put out. They, they're thinking, I want to be commercially relevant. I want to stay popular. The problem is people are, are hating on artists, and we always talk about this. If they don't put out a hit on radio, they're, oh, they're washed up. Oh, they're a has-been. They haven't had any hits in a while. So artists, they don't feel comf- comfortable just making their traditional style and pleasing their core fans. Now they feel like they have to go above and beyond, match what's young, match what's new, and it leads to stuff like this. I mean, as a 112 fan, I grew up on 112, I would love to still hear the classics, you know? Just please your core fan base, Ed. That's what we want. I'm with you. Here's the thing, though. Because I try to give the benefit of doubt, and you are definitely right. I think we don't understand where artists come from. And artists, when it comes down to it, and I'm not saying this is my man Mike, but I know this has been an issue for other artists. A lot of times we... We as fans, especially if you're listening to this podcast, if you're listening to this podcast, you're beyond the normal fan. Like, you're informed, you're intelligent. Yes, yeah. Most fans, well, most artists only know what they know. So all they know is their bubble. So they are going to do what worked for them in 1996 and 2000 and 98, whenever they had all those hits. They're going to follow that same formula because it worked before. And when it doesn't work, they're like, well, I need to do what everybody else is doing. And then they follow that formula, realizing that you're 20 years out of that circle, and then it doesn't quite work. So you've got artists, to Tom's point, struggling with being who they are versus being current. To be fair, as a big, giant, huge 112 stand myself, I want a mix. I I don't want 11296, because I already got that album. I'll go listen to that. I don't want that all over. But I don't want 112 sounding like Gucci Mane and these other weirdos. I want a happy medium. I want something that sounds like an evolution of a sound. That's the tricky part for artists, to be able to catch their core sound and not come off as stale, but also evolve with the times. So if yep. Mike's saying that he put out an album and it sounds too much like old 112... The 112 fan in me is like, oh, man, I want to hear that. But then do I really want to? Because am I going to hear it and it sounds like watered down knockoff 112? Or do I want something that sounds similar that moves forward? I think at the end of the day, that's what I really want, even though Mm -hmm. nostalgia tells me I want straight up old stuff. I see where they're coming from, and it's not an easy kind of line to balance on. Yeah, I agree, Ed. I mean... Well, let me- Kyle, <clears throat> there's producers yeah. out there making a progressive sound that would fit. You know, like, I love what K. Trinata is doing. It's electronic, but, it, you know, it has some more traditional elements. Like, there's producers they could link up with. 
to make them not sound trendy, but pro, you know, progressive sound. So, Kyle, I mean, what are your thoughts on the whole thing? I mean, like Ed said, this is a very tough spot for 112 to be in. You just really hope that the music, if it is trendy, that it's at least good. You know, at, that it at least is quality. I felt like their record that they put out last year tonight, it wasn't necessarily a bad record. I mean, it was a little trendy, and it did make me realize that 112 without Duran and Q, there is a difference there. But, mm-hmm. you know, it's tough. Like, I want to hear the ballads. Their last album had some of that. I wouldn't say it was my favorite 112 album, but it sort of still had those elements. Had a little bit of trendiness, but nothing that was crazy. Um, right. it, it's a tough one, because then I think back to like when New Edition split and BBD went to do their own thing. Ed, is there anyone out there that likes New Edition but didn't like Belle Biv DeVoe's album? Um, kind of me. Well, <laughs> please elaborate. <laughs> but I know... I. But I know I'm in the minority. I mean, I, I can recognize that BBD is great. It's just I prefer old school, new edition. But your point still stands. I see what you're saying. So it, it's it's an interesting place for them to be in because they're going to use BBD as the example and say, well, they ventured off, created their own sound, and they were just as successful and people liked it. But instances like those, that's, that's, that's tough. I, I don't know if 112 can pull it off, but... Mike and Slim, they're both great guys, so I'm hoping the best for them. Yeah, and to that BBD point, the other thing that helped them is that they totally rebranded. So you're looking at what New Edition was in the late 80s and what BBD was in the early 90s. It's kind of like a whole different sound. He's, it went from kind of like the, the almost, I don't say choir boys, but they had on the suits and they were like trying to sweet talk the girls then they went to the players in the early 90s, like all about the girls and partying. So it was a drastically different sound. If they weren't calling themselves New Edition, if 112, if this version of 112 wants to evolve and they call themselves, I don't know, Mike and Q, I mean Mike and Slim instead of 112, and then had a drastically different sound, they wouldn't be as tied to 112 as they were calling themselves 112. So that was part of the evolution of BBD as well. They totally rebranded. Not sure that's what they're trying to do since they're keeping the 112 flag waving pretty high here. But it's a tricky proposition for them either way. Hmm. So when we're talking about brands, I just got into an argument with our boy Todd Davis on Twitter about this. Tom, you'll be excited about this one. Um, he <laughs> feels like The Hustle, which is Music Soul Child's persona, that project that he put out, should be a knock against the Music Soul Child legacy. Do you feel that way as well? Because Music did purposely say that he rebranded so that people wouldn't, you know, look at the two as one. But, you know, that's what people are doing anyway because the face, the image is very similar. Yeah, people never really understood that whole thing. Um, I think he was smart. I mean, you guys could disagree and... He's explained to us on more than a number of occasions what he was trying to do. He was trying to flex his own creativity and um, try to do it under a different brand. So if you weren't there for that type of music, you didn't have to intertwine it with music. But a lot of people didn't get that. And, um, you know, he hasn't really done much with those brands in a while. So he's kind of left that in the past, it seems. I did really like the Purple Wonder Love, you know, project he did. That was cool, but... I actually could see why people would would feel that way. I mean, you know, it was a hard concept to really grasp. I mean, no one's really, I mean, Ed, correct me if I'm wrong, no one really has, maybe someone's done something like that, but not really. I don't know. I'm sure there's somebody, I'm blanking right now, and I'm sure somebody's going to hit me up on Twitter and tell me about the 15 artists who have done it that I'm blanking right Uh. now on. But it's funny that you mentioned it, Kyle, because Tom and I will be talking about this very subject Pretty soon on Soul and Stereo, yep. we got a head-to-head yep. on music coming up. But um, to your point, I don't know. I think that, it to me, I don't really see a lot of fans kind of conflating the two. The hustle just seemed to be like this thing that happened one time that we all forget about. It's like this bad dream. It's like, oh, that was a terrible thing, and we forgot. But I don't see that tied at all to music's legacy. It's just a side project that he did that he distinctly branded as something separate. And it didn't really work. But, again, I always am here for artists to 
try to flex their creativity and try to do different things because you never know. Sometimes it works. Sometimes you hit on something. Sometimes it doesn't quite work out. But it was kind of smart to not brand it as a music album because that way it doesn't fall under the radar. I don't know. I just feel like it was an anomaly. I don't think it affects his legacy. Not that much. And I'll just, I'll just say, Kyle, um, if you look up The Hustle on YouTube, um, he doesn't really have a ton of views. So it's quite possible a lot of people never even knew what was going on with that. So, I mean, that's just another thing to consider as well. And there's that. Are we ready to talk about Young M.A.? Oh, oh my God. Yes. I'm always ready for this, player. I'm fired up. Did you guys see the tweet that she put out? Of course. But break it down for those who may have not. Music don't feel the same because we barely have R&B. R&B brung that balance to music. Now everything is leaning one way, shakes my head. And so it gets played out quick. We need R&B for the balance. No cap. Now, <laughs> my thoughts are this. Because we always talk about this on the podcast, so I don't want to regurgitate or reiterate anything that we've already said in terms of R&B not being in the mainstream. People need to look deeper. But what I would like to bring out here is the fact that she caused up this stir and this controversy and this conversation all over social media. We saw PJ Morton talking about it. We saw Tank talking about it. I want to hear you guys talking about it. But my whole thing is this. This reminds me so much of when Jacquees claimed that he was the king of mm. R&B like two years ago. It pissed off everyone on the internet for about a week. And then it was just business as usual. We were just trapping again, auto-tuning again. So, man, I'm tired of this. I'm tired of it because none of y'all, and I'm talking about all of y'all, nobody puts their money where their mouth is. Like, we always holler with the Jacquees situation, for example. I remember for, like, 48 hours, everyone was sharing their favorite R&B artists of the past and celebrating the music and blah, blah, blah. And then once we had a new trending topic, we were off of that and back to pretending that Future is the best R&B artist of the 2000s. Like, is that is how, that's, I mean, we have absolutely no, our, our, our memories are just so short term with this. There's no consistency. That's why I never take anything on the internet with any type of, nothing but a grain of salt. Because there's no consistency behind anything. We talk because it's hot at the moment and there's no substance behind it. I'm not even mad at Young and May's comments at, on the surface. Because it's clearly someone who's talking. Again, we like to think that artists are as knowledgeable about music as we are. That ain't true. They're knowledgeable about their music, but nothing else. So obviously, Young and May ain't paying attention to what's going on in R&B. But to pretend that nobody's out here doing it just because it's not on your radio is extremely short-sighted. Like I said on Twitter, I don't want to hear the excuse of, oh, well, I know it's out there, but I shouldn't have to work for it. You know what y'all work for? Every raggedy meme, every Spongebob meme, every time you want to throw somebody under the bus and cancel somebody, you can dig up a Trump tweet from 2013 with absolutely no problem, player. But you can't take a second to click on a Snow Allegra link? Get out of here. <laughs> it's laziness. You want it. So if this was 2000, yes, the great hits would be served to you on a platter. Doesn't work like that because it's a totally different industry. But to discount all of the artists out here that are doing great, great things and saying, well, I don't see it because you ain't looking, how disrespectful is that? And I know I'm preaching to the choir because everybody here knows the good music. You know where to find it. You just go to either Soul and Stereo or You Know I Got Soul. It's right there for you. So there's no excuse. But for the normal person just to be like, well, I just wanted it. You didn't have to do that in 1991. Well, there's a lot of things you didn't have to do in 1991. You got to do now. So that's life. Get over it. Stop mm -hmm. disrespecting the artists that are doing great work out here. Mm. Tom, I'm going to throw a couple of names for you guys. Uh, but Tom, I want to start off. PJ Morton replied to that tweet. Listed out some of his favorite singers. And you replied to it. And you stirred up some stuff there <laughs> listen i was so happy that pj morton finally spoke up i've been begging for him to become more of a vocal ambassador of r&b especially as someone who's had some of the best music we've heard in years 
um, hard, one of the hardest working. He's putting out albums, you know, has won Grammys for his work. I've been begging for him to speak up, and he did. And I was excited to see that until I saw him list names of artists who he felt were doing good music. Now, I have nothing wrong with the names he listed, guys, but PJ, man, I'm sorry, but you failed, and I called you out on it because I had to. I mean, you it looks like this was either a, a sponsored list of artists, you know, from major labels who paid you to post their names because you didn't name any 90s artists besides Rashawn, Rashawn Patterson. I mean, come on. Where are all the other great 90s artists who are still making great music, PJ? Do you not? So the point he was trying to make was you're just not looking for it. You're just not trying to find it. It's still out there, the good music. Well, I don't even know if he's looking for it himself or trying to find it. That's the way I, you know, <laughs> I was left with reading this. I'm, I'm mad, guys. Well, I didn't see the list in full. I saw his comment, and I know he tagged like 50 million people, and I saw Summer Walker and then stopped reading. So I don't <laughs> know who was or was not tagged. But the... I will give him this benefit. I don't know if it was true because, again, I, we have not talked to him. And maybe this is it. I wonder if, because PJ is a very, like, PJ knows stuff. He is very informative when it comes to music. So maybe he was just naming artists who had put out stuff recently, like in the past 12 months. And maybe that's why Rasai got the shout out and a Tamia didn't. I don't know. But I'm trying to give him the benefit of the doubt no. there. And maybe that's why. But again, I no. ain't see the full list, so maybe it's not, that was definitely he was not just it. short-sighted. I mean, I, I'll reiterate, he didn't name necessarily bad artists. Like they're all pretty good. Who he named? It's just that there Summer was a lot Walker. more. Excuse me. <laughs> I mean, I mean, Eric Bellinger was on the list, which was kind of odd. Six Slack, Brent Fias. I mean, it, it got kind of weird. Tink, out of all people, was on this list. I mean, and, wait, Tom. You know, Tom. Yeah. Did Kevin Ross make the list? No. Kevin Ross is not oh, okay. on there. That's Tank sad. made the list, which, it's, which to me, come on, PJ, how do you name Tank? I mean, that, that to me, and we have this love-hate relationship with Tank, but that to me loses all credibility for this list when you name Tank for the music he's currently making. Tank doesn't make sense at all when you're thinking about because he is he is the antithesis of what this post was about. So it doesn't make sense that he was named either. I don't know. I can't speak for him. I'm glad that he spoke up as to what you said because he's a young artist that has the ear of listeners. And he's out here winning Grammys and excelling at his craft. And his music is good. Again, I didn't see the list, so I can't nitpick. But I am giving him props for at least speaking up. He gets that much love, at least. Kyle, you know what's what's funny about this list? He didn't even name JoJo. And that's who helped him win his Grammy recently. Really That's pretty funny to me. <laughs> That's weird. Well, yep. That's sad. I'm just but... saying it, it's it's kind of <laughs> that's why I called him out for this list. I mean, come on. Yeah, I don't know. Just just <laughs> make the post. Just don't make a list. Like if he just had made the post and and said you're not looking for it, it's out there. That's fine. You don't need to list like random friends of yours to make it look, you know. It just didn't make sense to me. And you may have hit it right there. He may was just shouting out his friends. It could have been just that deep. And that's what he hey was man, trying to put on. You tag them, you network with them, and then you hope to collaborate with Summer Walker one day. I love it. Oh, oh God. Uh, uh, well, t- Tom, you uh, you said the magic word earlier. So I guess we'll have to go tank. there. I know. Uh, uh, calm down. Is, and is I know we have a lot. <laughs> no, oh, okay. <laughs> I know we have a Sorry. lot to talk about after this topic, so we don't want to spend too much time on it, but I know you guys are fired up for this one. And I'll just start off by saying, yes, the keyword is tank, and I have a completely different view on this than you guys do, as you are aware. I am extremely ecstatic that the general has returned to r and the man who gave us sex, love, and pain is back. He's bringing it back to the basics. He announced it on his Instagram page. And guys, I'm ready. I'm ready for more Please Don't Goes. Maybe I deserves. You're my star. Man, I understand what he had to do to get to this point. But guys, I'm ready. What are your thoughts of Tank returning to R&B? 
Well, <laughs> maybe you deserve to have a better role model. You keep talking about, oh, Tank is bank. What, what, where's the quality? Has he given you anything but some shallow tweets? I don't Listen. know, Kyle. I don't know, Kyle. I think he's been saving it, though. Did you guys hear the SLP2 intro? Oh, man. Tank's got it. He, he's just been doing this for money all this whole time. He's ready to return to his roots, guys. It's gonna be, it's gonna be one of the best albums we've ever heard. Well, I'll let you expound before I explode. Go ahead, Tom. <laughs> explode, Tank. Yes. There's a reason we have this 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 love hate relation. I'll let Kyle expound on this, but there's a reason we have a love hate relationship with Tank, just like we have with Usher. We know it's in there somewhere, right, Kyle? Yeah, they show glimpses of it. And then they throw yep. a bunch of trap drums yep. in it, and then it just all falls to the wayside. But, Ed, you have to be excited about this. I mean, what is your beef with Tank? He had to go make money for his family. It's it's real life. you gotta you got to earn that income. But now he's back. He's ready to take over the game. Once again, the last time we heard him go back to the basics was on the Stronger album, which I know you loved. So we're ready, right? Um, first of all, I ain't got to do nothing, sir, but stay black and die. So I ain't got to do nothing for <laughs> Tank. Tom, remember back in the 90s, there was a brother by the name of the Mad Rapper. Yes, of course. Legend. Yes. Well, let me tell you why I'm mad, because I'm about to be the Mad Podcaster oh, right about now. no. I'm hot. Yes, I am. I'm heated about this whole situation. Tank, how dare you, sir? How dare you, player? And you know why I'm heated? Because remember one month ago, turn back, go back to about three or four episodes of this podcast. Remember when your girl Kay Michelle did this same thing and she spoke up about how R&B was losing its passion? Who was the first person to run up on Al Gore's internet? Throw on that cape, wag his finger in her face, talking about trap his life, and he's defending these quote-unquote young rappers. This dude. Now, what, 60 days later? This is the same dude talking about trap is whack, just because P.J. Morton had his little response, and the post went viral. Dude can't stay consistent for two months. Two months. And his brother ain't dropped a consistent album in 10 years, so I need consistency back in his life. Oh, But anyway, oh. Here's, here's why I'm pissed for real. He is an opportunist. This is all about clicks and views. One minute he's like, oh, you better respect these young artists. Like he isn't, what, 70-something himself. And at the end of the day, this wasn't even about young versus old. He just did that for social media clout. He did that to suck up to the youngins. The whole conversation with Kay Michelle was the same thing with young and man PJ Morton, bringing soul back to R&B. So now that PJ is talking about it and PJ is getting positive response and his post is going viral, now all of a sudden, yeah, I'm bringing it back. Play it, the only thing you bringing back is clout chaser. That's all this is. And, and I can't remember which one of y'all told me this, didn't he say that he's going to expound on it on his new podcast? Oh, yeah. Didn't I see we that? So we have when a did Tank guys. get... We got competition, uh -huh. bros. When did Tank get replaced by an emotionally needy 12-year-old? Why does the only thing he has to do is afford attention, clicks, and... this Look, player, you've been in this game too long to be jumping from trend to trend. You're a legend. Act like one. Stop riding, riding these waves of popularity. Because that's wait, all wait. it's about. Popularity. Did, did you say legend? Did I say what? I thought, I thought you just said you're a legend. Act like one. Yeah, I did. Oh, you Tank's think a Tank is a legend? What? No, that was just me. No, I was on oh, my rant. Oh, my goodness. Oh. This is breaking news. I was, Oh, gosh. Now I'm taken out of context. No, he's not a legend. This is what happens when I get on my stuff. I just start speaking out. You're a veteran. Ed, You're not a legend. Well, Ed, Ain't been Ed, enough when did you get on this, the mountains. When did you get to this realization that Tank was a legend? Was it when he put out When We? Um, that's around the time that I took away all of the legend credentials. He can't even get it now. Retroactively, uh, Kyle, he'll never be a legend. Kyle, we're going to be rubbing this in for like the next year. On, on every wow. episode. <sighs> Well, uh, my brother misspoke it. and now I never hear the end of it at the end of the day <laughs> can I get back to my point my point is dealing with this flip flopping dude all I want is consistency and if you can't be consistent 
and you're just here for clicks and attention, then be gone. I don't need you. And that's all this is about. Riding the wave, getting some hashtags, getting some attention, whether it's picking on K. Michelle or riding PJ Morton's wave. And now he's got a podcast that he wants y'all to tune into and pretend that he's going to come out with Sex, Love, and Pain 3. Come on hmm. now. I'm ready Either for that. Either be about it or be away. <laughs> Well, Tom, I, I'll, I'll tell you what's I'll tell you what's funny here. When I interviewed Tank yeah. about four months ago, when his Elevation album dropped, he said specifically in the interview that he would never go back. That it was all about progression and elevating his sound to the new heights and new levels. And I got into a pretty heated discussion with our girl Betty Mills about this. One of the readers on our social media pages, and uh, she was defending Tank. She said, "Let Tank be. He just wants to elevate his career. If that's what he wants to do, we should let him do it." So I said, "Okay, we'll do that." Four months later, <laughs> here we are today, and Tank is going back, which he claimed he would never do. I hit up our girl Betty about it. I said, "So what is this all about?" And all she could say was, "I don't know." Uh, <laughs> I don't mean, love that? listen, guys. People, people messed up because Tank has re- released some amazing songs. You're my star? Are you kidding me? I lo- that's one of the best songs I heard in the past decade, Ed. Are you kidding me? And no one even oh, supported Oh, yeah, I'm it. kidding you, all right. It ain't that hype. You Don't Know with Wale. That was a huge hit in the making. No one even supported that one. So what is Tank supposed to do? He's got mouths to feed. I don't blame him. Now, coming back to traditional R&B... Yeah, he he might be in for a rude awakening, guys. I mean, it's not going to you know sell, but it really makes you wonder if his last project didn't really do what he was expecting. He's just like throwing his hands up and saying, "Whatever, no one's going to support me either way. I'll just do what I want to do." Yeah, I can't be believe you two are actually buying into this dude's mess. This was two months ago. He was talking about, "I'll never go back. I'm trapped for life." Now, no. because the, the convo has changed, now no. it's like, oh, okay, now I want to get back on it. You want to get back on it because you're three albums in the hole. All of them were garbage. The only thing you Listen. had was a little hotness off of Win We. <laughs> Listen, the, the label told him to say that, guys, right, Kyle? Yes, I, I guess he... Yeah, I mean, on his, <laughs> on his post, he said, he admitted that he, quote-unquote, sold out. But now it's time to get back to real music. So, Ed, the first step to changing your habits is acknowledgement. And he's admitted that he sold out there. So we got to give him a pass for that. Absolutely not. Y'all still giving them passes off of albums that came out in 2006. I ain't doing it. I need to see some content. And when was the last great Tank song? Sex, Love, and Pain 2 intro? Come on now. That was a great song, guys. That's like two <laughs> two albums worth of forgiveness. If you put out that one That's, song, we could. <laughs> Tom, that song is older than your son. Get over oh. it. It's not happening. Oh wow! So new Tank album expected probably this year or maybe next year, and a new Tank podcast set to come out this year or next year as well, featuring Jay Valentine. So that should be mm. fun. Uh, I'm I sure I won't more. be invited as a guest on that one. Probably not. (laughs) But we've got one more hard-hitting question for you guys here. Uh, Diddy is set to do Making the Band. And when all of this conversation (sighs) was going down, Diddy, the man that brought us people like 112, Faith Evans, Total, had a huge part in the early parts of Mary J. Blige, Jodeci. Can't forget about Day 26. Debut is still fire. But... Puff said, I got to bring R&B back. We're going to do that with the Kyle, making the band. We're going to have whatever one the, female whatever group. Whatever the question is, whatever the question is, the answer is no. <laughs> Calm down. <laughs> <laughs> one female group and one male group. Guys, can Puff bring R&B back with these two groups? No. Again, it's the same thing with Tank. I don't... Everybody was all... Where was this energy before? Everybody's on this energy all of a sudden in the past month. And they have had decades to bring this energy to the genre. And they were quiet as church mice. Now, all of a sudden, people want to do it. You got to show and prove to me 
I don't want to hear about Day 26 that came out a decade ago. And then I have seen no quality R&B from you since. Or talking about dudes that came out in the 90s. Because that was 20 years ago. I need some current receipts that read a date 20 with a 1 behind it. Or a 2 behind it. Not stuff that happened before there were iPhones. Because that's what his track record is looking like. I don't believe anything until I hear it. Because it sounds like me, social media cloud. It's funny, Kyle, because... Remember Last Train to Paris? Dirty Money? Yep. Yep. I feel like back then, and that was in 2010. We're talking almost 10 years ago. I feel like mm-hmm. back then, he, he, he did he still have the clout to kind of go his own direction? Because that album, in my opinion, didn't sound like anything that was out at the time. And it was kind of, it was pretty cool, you know, to hear that. But at this point, yep. where Diddy's at, I don't think he can still, you know, afford to go the direction he wants and people will just follow. Like, he can't just do a sound that's not popular, like traditional R&B, and it's all of a sudden going to become popular. It's not, it's not going to... I mean, Kyle, do you agree or disagree? Guys, this is P. Diddy. This is Puff Daddy. No, this guy is no. the influencer of influencers. So, do I believe he'll be able to bring R&B back? Absolutely. He has the facilities, what? the ability, <laughs> the money. He has it all. Diddy is going to bring R&B back. Now, I will question whether... These artists that he's signing will actually get paid. I think that's a whole different story, and hopefully they can stay together for more than one album. But I'm telling you guys, Diddy can do it. If he puts his mind to it, Puff is your guy. I'm telling you guys. Putting his mind to it is the operative phrase. Have I seen him put his mind in anything recently other than whatever it is, his umbrella companies and t-shirt companies? I have not seen the commitment to music in a freaking decade, unless you count... The greatness that is freaking French Montana. I don't really see his track record being that great. So, absolutely not. I have a right to be skeptical whether it's him, whether it's Raggedy Tank, or anybody else. Show and prove. Hmm. But Wait, hold on. Tom. Hold on, Ed. Is, is Sean John clothing line still around? I haven't seen Sean John in forever. <laughs> yeah. I I'm think the asking. last time I saw Sean John... Uh, I Need a Girl Part 2 was still out, Tom, on radio. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I used to love Sean John. I still have a Sean John t-shirt I wear around the house sometimes. I'm about to it go on eBay and find one right now, believe it or not. All right. That's classic right there. <laughs> and we can't forget about Sean John. Puff. We can't forget about Puff's uh, successful venture with Ciroc. That's like your favorite vodka, Tom. Actually, it is, believe it or not. I mean, you came so. out here in New York. You had a couple shots of Ciroc. You were never the same again, Kyle. I would see Puff. Puff does that to you, but speaking <laughs> yeah, of making the this band, explains a lot. We have a <laughs> couple more hard hitting questions here. So, with this making the band, Ed, do you think making the band can still work in this era? Oh, I think so, definitely. Look at the biggest shows on TV now: the um, The Voice, and what's the show where people dress up in the Power Ranger monster costumes, and like oh, you gotta guess singer. who they are. Yes, yeah, stuff like that. Yeah. Like, there is definitely a market for reality show slash music, and with the legacy that's gone behind making the band and you know puff punking these kids out and making them get cheesecake and stuff, people love <laughs> drama and foolishness. So of course there's a market for it. But again, if we look at like the band, the group, the band, and even Day Twenty Six, like they never really lasted for real. They fell apart too quickly. So. Just because you get exposure doesn't guarantee a decade-long career. So I think it'll mm. be great for ratings. Will it amount to something as far as a career? Uh, his track record is not great. Uh. <laughs> well, we're on to the Play a Please Award now, and this actually coincides with the hard-hitting questions. Uh, Quavo is set to be a judge on making the band. P. Diddy is putting together an R&B group. Does this make sense, Tom? He's judging R&B music? I guess so. I mean, I would hope they're, they're going to put him on TV to give a speech on how he helped tear down music in general. Mm. <laughs> Ed? This is Quavo. I can't wait. Well, that just proves auto-tune is on the way. Uh, Real R&B means a bunch of Roger Troutman clones. It's coming. There's no way that... I mean, that... I can't see this kid because 
if you're putting together a new group, right, in 2020, these kids are not going to yep. be traditional singers. They're going to be, you know, influenced by what's current. How are they going to be, you know, it's not bringing R&B back, guys. And, I mean, the, the inclusion of Quavo says it because I know from a marketing standpoint, this show is going to be marketed toward teenagers, early 20s. So you have to yeah. get somebody relevant. You got to get Quavo. You got to get Cardi. You got to get the baby. You got to get all these guys. They aren't going to be traditional R&B artists. The closest thing in that group is like, what, her? That would be the only one that kind of would be a name. And I doubt they throw yeah. her up there. She's not going to be wearing her Mankind mask, hiding in the shadows <laughs> like Noob Saban. So <laughs> She doesn't do that anymore. She doesn't do that well, anymore, guys. Well, whatever. My point is, there is going to have to be some kind of bowing down to popular culture. And unfortunately, R&B ain't popular in the culture right now. So yeah. by design, this is already going to work against it. I mean, I hope it doesn't, but throwing freaking Migos in it already, it already shows what this is about. Well, some other people that are involved in this right now, I saw on the Instagram clips, I see Monica um, at, the, at the auditions. I saw Troy Taylor there, Dal- Dallas Austin, JD, B. Cox. So guys, there are some valid uh, members to this show so we shall see what happens diddy i'm rooting for you get me a record on bad boy <laughs> oh, God. give me some old sean john that's all i want i'm on ebay I'm and then you get it for cheap right here it might come from china but <laughs> I bet. it's cheap china. <laughs> i will get some bootleg sean john from yeah, it's, china it's Thanks. bootleg kyle it's not it's not legit but that's all i got left all right uh, can we get into the soul backtrack of the day here? Yep. I guess. There better not be any tank. No, we're going to go bad boy here. Can we go with the Toto and Biggie record, can't you see? Mm. We definitely can. I was just saying over on Twitter not long ago that I feel like that was one of... Biggie was a master of the... I think someone asked what was the best kind of R&B feature for Biggie, and I'm like, that's got to be the best one. That man mm. knew how to do a guest verse. Wow. Tom? Why'd you pick that one, Kyle? I remember Chris Webber being in the music video, and I was just watching clips of really? Chris Webber earlier. Yeah. C- Chris Webber's Chris in the video? Chris Webber. Makes a cameo appearance. 1995, indeed. Huh. Chris. Shout out to Chris. Is he in the NBA Hall of Fame? No, he's not right now. I didn't think so. Oh. Came up short. He, uh, yeah, he's doing some shady stuff with the NCAA, so I don't think uh, he'll ever mm. get in, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, but speaking of which, uh, Ed, what's going on with SoInStereo.com? Man, it's been a pretty good week, even though I've been a little bit out of the loop. Um, shout out to some of my contributors and a lot of people who helped out while the boy was away to keep things moving and grooving. We got a new edition of Love Letters up with this... Um, <laughs> Let me read this question real quick, because I thought that it was cut and dry, but it seems like the female perspective is a little different than the male perspective. Here's the question. So my boyfriend decided for his birthday that he would go home for his birthday weekend. We live in Georgia. So I'm assuming these people don't live in Georgia. Now it's his special day, so he can do whatever he wants. But I am in my feelings because I thought he would have at least spent one day with me in case I wanted to do something for his birthday. Am I wrong in feeling like this? This just shows me, in my opinion, where our relationship stands and my place in life. I thought Plaid was pretty cut and dry. You're mad because you wanted him to do something with you for his birthday. He decided to do something else, but you didn't ask. So you're mad because you wanted to play a weird guessing game and he guessed wrong. Hmm. You whack. But the female readers of the Soul and Stereo and the Soul and Stereo Cypher on Facebook thought the dude was wrong, and he's up to some shady stuff. So anyway, go check that post out. Very interesting response to that. As well as, of course, we've got Head to Head with Ed. Kind of loving this feature. Thanks to everybody who's helping out with that. My man Nick Eden came through, and we're talking about Drew Hill, their best albums, their worst albums. 
And we answered the big question, is Drew Hill the best male R&B group of the 90s? So go check that one out. And, and to kind of wrap up Black History Month, if you follow me on Instagram, you've been seeing that every day I've kind of been featuring albums that kind of speak to the black experience. So someone suggested you need to make a playlist of that. So that's what we did. All songs from all 29 albums are compiled in one really cool playlist. And that's up on Soul and Stereo as well. So, busy week for your boy. Hmm. Tom, honestly, if it were me and I didn't get invited to this birthday party, I'm just going to stay home and play the X-Men on the arcade. Remember that game? Listen. <laughs> me that's too. Classic, I'm joining you. Listen, you got to pick Colossus if you're playing the X-Men the arcade game. But, I'm, Ed, <laughs> yes. your stories make me just happy I'm married, man. A happily married man. Otherwise, man, it's tough out there right now. Play, uh, I wouldn't even know what to do. If I wasn't <laughs> married, I'd just be shutting the house playing X-Men with Kyle because I can't do all this mind reading and game guessing. If you wanted to do something with the man for his birthday, just say, hey, do you want to go to, I don't know. What do people do for dates these days, Tom? I'm married. I don't know. Uh, Let's go to the skating rink. Yeah, Pizza Pizza Hut. Hut. I don't know. Let's (laughs) let's go eat greasy pizza. Why I say, what do you want to do? I don't know. I want to do this. And then you're mad at him because he didn't guess what you wanted him to do? Y'all weird. Ugh. Tanking (laughs) women. So weird. Oh, man. We we got a lot less drama on our site, Kyle. You're just killing it with these interviews. Why don't you talk about some of the ones you did recently? Yeah, I mean, I just interviewed B. Cox uh, recently. Got that on the website, and if you got, if you haven't actually listened to the audio, I actually only like transcribed half of it because the other half of it I wanted to see if people would actually listen to. But B. Cox um, lists his top five favorite R&B producers, and we had a full-on discussion on that, so that was kind of dope. Um, and then the cool part about that interview, of course, he talks about the new Usher album. But one of the things was uh, he worked on a record for LMA's debut album the song dangerous and lma specifically asked for a song that sounded like a day 26 record so really? guys yeah so even though she might not know three aretha franklin songs she knows day 26 music she's in the r&b <laughs> hall Ed, that's Ed, putting her- we we should never mention her again that pot on this podcast just for that one reason itself Come yeah on. i think we're gonna ban her from now on her and tank are both thrown into um <laughs> They oh. are thrown in the recycle bin. No, Tank we, is we fine, love. but Summer, Summer Walker's out, but Tank is still in. Oh, Summer Walker's always been. First of all, Tank is not <laughs> fine ever. But Summer Walker, throw you her away. You a legend. I do you like, said legendary Tank. I think I meant to say lecherous and not legend. I got my L's mixed up while I was on my oh. rant. We all know Lecher- what that means, so it's still legend. Yeah, so. you, please oh, define God. lecherous. <laughs> <sighs> this is the cast of characters I got to work with. I'm going to have to go on Tank's podcast and get a, a new show. Oh, wow. wow. Imagine. Barry wow. Bars, you're back in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, guys, uh, along with Beacox, I interviewed Jazz recently, so we'll get that one posted. He really wanted us to hear his side of the story. So we'll get to hear that. Uh, got a couple of interviews that I'm still working on. Rich Harrison is happening. We're just trying to figure out a date. It's taking a little longer than usual, but... We're going to make that happen at some point. I think there was someone else that I'm working um, on for an interview. I'm just trying We're to We're working on Music Soul Child, don't forget. Music yeah, Soul Stokely, Child. Yes. That's who it was. Stokely. That was Stokely. who it was. Yeah, so we have a lot coming, so just stay tuned. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, we're just going to continue posting interesting questions on social media as well. So yep. feel free to chip in and let me hear your two, thought, your two cents on this. So, um, But I guess... I guess with that said, that's it for this week. Tank, uh, I guess he won't block us on Instagram, right? <laughs> uh, no, I think we're cool. We shout out SLP too. Come on, guys. No, Tank, look, Tank, if you're listening and Tank's minions, don't block them. Block me. My account is E.T. Bowser on Twitter and oh, Edward geez. Bowser on Instagram. Block hey. me. You can leave these brothers alone. <laughs> He would never block you, dude. You called him a legend. And we never went that Oh, my. Uh, (laughs) Actually. I will never live this down. When when Ed was talking, I thought he was going to say something like, look, Tank, we know you're great. We just want you to put good music. But that went completely sideways. Ed, we will never live this down for for 365 days from now. 
Unfortunately, I know you're right. So, that does it. Kyle signing out with Tom and Ed, and I'm going to go listen to the legendary tank. Peace out, guys. (laughs) Peace. Peace. Goodbye. 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 Goodbye.